If you will, open your Bibles to the book of Job. We'll continue our Bible survey. And I actually is supposed to be in the book of Leviticus this morning, but I skipped the book of Job. The book of Job is actually complementary to the book of Genesis. Uh, Job um, experience is the experience of a believer during the time period of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, I know in your English Bible, the book of Job is positioned different, but actually the book of Job um, is actually complementary to the book of Genesis. And so we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to look at a lesson through a test about the sovereignty of God. The book of Job is all about the sovereignty of God. Uh, the author of the book of Job, uh, some believe that Job wrote it, some believe Moses wrote it, and some also believe that an eyewitness uh, wrote it, uh, maybe one of Job's friends. Job's name means persecuted or hatred. He was tested but remained faithful to God for the most part of his life. He stood up under trials with patience and trusted in the sovereignty of God. He was, a, he was not a believer who was easily shaken by trials. His faith was tested. The time frame of Job, as I mentioned, is Abraham, time, Isaac, and Jacob. Job was a historical person. Some people don't believe that he was a historical person, but he was. And he lived during the time of the Hebrew fathers. He lived about 140 years after his trials ended. And we see that in Job 42, 16. So he probably was a little older than 140 years. What inspired the writing of the book of Job? What inspired the writing of the book of Job? Or who inspired? Well, God inspired the writing of this book because he wanted to provide answer to some of man's questions like, why do good things happen to good people? Now, keep in mind that God looks at good totally different than how we view good. How can a loving God allow things to happen? Does God exist since it seems as though he is not concerned about suffering that we go through in this world because he allows certain things to happen? How can he be in control yet he don't stop certain things from happening to his children who are righteous? So these are some of the questions that uh, men have. And I think God inspired this book to be written to answer these questions. You know, I kid my friend here. He always have questions for me. And he laughs when every time he come at me with questions, I say, oh, the Bible got an answer for that. <laughs> but anyway, God inspired this book uh, so that these questions in particular will be answered. I don't know if you guys, uh, well, some of you know, I'm sure most of you know and have heard of the man by the name of Charles Darwin. And he is the one that uh, came up with the idea of evolution. And, and actually, believe it or not, he used to go to church. He used to go to church. But when he went to church one Sunday, they were singing a hymn. And the hymn uh, goes something like this. Now, I'm not going to sing because I don't want to put anybody to sleep. Uh, but anyway, the song goes like this. The world is a beautiful place and God made it all. But during that particular time in his life, his daughter was dying. So in his life, things was not so beautiful. And so he could not see how a, uh, a creator could allow such tragic events to happen. And so he said, well, there is no creator because if there were, he would not allow such tragic events. So he went on to explain creation apart from a creator 
because of a tragic event that happened in his life. And guess what? A lot of people have bought into that lie. That he must not exist because of the thing that he allowed to happen in our world. We see throughout the Bible, God repaying good with uh, good and bad with evil. But in the book of Job, it is not that case. Because God is going to allow suffering in the life of a righteous man named Job. How can he be loving then and allow this to happen to a righteous man? Yes, Job was a righteous man, but I don't think Job actually got what he really deserved <laughs> from God's perspective, even though he went through a lot. But I think that God even dealt with Job in grace and allowing it. Job unjust suffering would give him a great opportunity to be a witness of God's sovereignty, God's goodness, and God's love, even in times of disaster. We all, at some point in time of another, in our Christian life, would go through trials, and sometimes we will get overwhelmed with self-pity. And Job, he is a righteous man. He is a, a believer uh, who during that time was very mature, uh, but over time he became overwhelmed with, and by self-pity. And he bowed a problem with, why is God silent? Why is he not answering me? Why is he not explaining why I'm going through what I'm going through? Um, and so just like Job, we all at some time want answers to why certain things happen or why we have to suffer, especially when you come to church regularly, you're praying like you should, you're spending quality time in the Bible, you're helping the old lady across the street, you're uh, doing a lot of good, wonderful things. And then all of a sudden, suffering happened. And I know I've been there and done that. God allowed uh, suffering in this man's life. He allowed Satan to knock all of his props that support human earthly existence out from under Job. If our happiness depends on wealth, family, being healthy, or any detail of life, you will fail the test of losing wealth, losing family, losing health, or losing any detail of life. But we see from the beginning of the book of Job that Job Happiness did not depend on anything outside. It did not depend on his wealth. It did not depend on his family. It did not depend on his health. It did not depend on the details of life because of how we saw him responding to losing all of those things. So a little bit about Job. One, he was a believer in Jesus Christ as God revealed himself in that time. Two, he was a man that feared God. And we see that in verse one. Let's read verse one. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turned away from evil. And not only that, if you look at verse two and three, uh, he was a multimillionaire. And back then, wealth was determined based on your lifestyle and your material possession. He had children who were beautiful, yet they were not perfect. He was a man that had a lot of good friends. Well, he had, he was a, I don't say good friend, I'm just say he was a man that had a lot of friends. <laughs> because when you see his friends, you go like, those are not really good friends. He was a man who was consistent learning from God as God made learning the word available, though he did not have everything that we have today. Job was a man that uh, utilized the, the, the truths about God that was available to him. He didn't have the completed revelation of God that we have today, which put us in such an, an advantage over Job when we face some of the similar situation that he's going to face. He had capacity for blessing. He had the capacity to be blessed um, by God. Why? Why? because he loved God more than he loved the blessing in itself. 
See, whenever we love God more than the blessing, we have the capacity to receive more blessing. But any time that we uh, love the blessing more than the blesser, we don't have the capacity for more blessing. I kid the guys in prison. I tell them, I said, why would God give you a million dollars? If, if God gives some of y'all a million dollars, you're going to kill yourself. And, uh, and you're not going to have nothing to do with God. You're just going to be trying to find ways that you can spend that million dollars. And, uh, but Joe had the capacity for blessing because he loved the God more than he loved the blessing, the blessing itself. His fellowship with God was more important than the blessing. What was the purpose of the book of Job? Well, one, it explained why the righteous suffer, why the righteous suffer. Two, it was a lesson about the sovereignty of God in blessing people more than he blessed others. You know, some people think that they can secure blessing through trusting and obeying God. I was like that one time. You know, I thought that in order to have blessing from God, I need to trust him and I need to obey him. In a sense, there's nothing wrong with that because God will bless us when we obey and trust him. But we can't manipulate God to bless us by trying to be good or trust him. It's good to do that, but sometimes we lose perspective. And, 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 and if we think that by obeying and trusting God, only good things should happen, then you will pretty much be damaged when good things don't happen or always happen. The book, uh, though we will be blessed through trust and obeying God, it is by his grace that we are blessed and not that we deserve it. Even if God bless us because of our obedience and trust, it's never because we just deserve the blessing. We always deserve worse than what he gives us. And so, uh, you know, the book brings out how people try to control God by being good or have the idea that they deserve blessing because they are good. And Job fought, fell into that trap too. Uh, his friends did. They all thought that, you know, uh, you know, Job only expect good things. Why? Because of his integrity, you know, and that's understandable. Um, but even if God, even the blessing that God gave him was not that he deserved it because I'm sure he wasn't as good as God was is good. He's not as perfect as God is perfect. Uh, according to a world standard, he was actually, you know, better than most people during his day, but the blessing was by grace. Something, especially in the case of Job's friend, that God will only bless them when they're obedient and trusting him. Man, how many times have you realized in your life that you have been blessed and you know you don't even deserve it? So blessed or not from blessing is from the sovereignty of God and from his grace. In grace, God does not give us what we deserve, but we do not deserve. We always deserve worse than we deserve, especially if we see good from God's perspective. From God's perspective, we always get, uh, we don't always get what we deserve. God does not deal with man based on human retribution or give people what they deserve. This is not always how God deal with mankind. But Job friend uh, and Job himself, you know, God had got to give them more revelation. They were very ignorant of that. They thought that retribution um, come based on what one deserve or not deserve, or whether one is good or whether one is bad. This is not always how God deal with us. Sometimes he allowed man to be blessed with what he don't deserve. And sometimes he allowed man to suffer what he do not deserve to suffer. Joel is an example of that. Another reason, uh, purpose of the book of Joel, it reveals a response from Joel who trusts and obey God and a response from his friend who witnessed Job's suffering. Joel concluded, that God was unjust at some point in his life. That's self pity a little bit. Even though God had been good. I mean, even though he had been good. He said, I've been good. So God is unjust for allowing these things to happen to me. God will allow him to suffer anyway in spite of his goodness. And so he accused God of being unjust. His friend thought Job must have been 
had a ha, had been a bad man because they thought that God reward good and bring bad on those who are bad. And that is not always the case. Sometimes God actually blesses and grace bad people or not give bad people what they deserve. And that is his sovereignty. Who are we to tell God that you should not be gracious to that person? <laughs> but that's our attitude sometimes, especially when we have the question, why do God allow that man to live and allow this man here uh, to not live. And he was actually better than him, you know, but so we're questioning the sovereignty of God and showing grace to some and choosing to give others what they don't deserve, what they deserve. So Job friend was wrong in their assessment of Job's situation. They did not have all the facts. Sometimes men think they got all the facts. God do bless the godly. He do punish the ungodly, but in life, his sovereignty doesn't, just allow good and doesn't always give man what he deserves. In his sovereignty, he is free to bless and he is free to withhold blessing as he chooses. And if he choose not to punish immediately in his grace, the bad person, that's his prerogative because he is God. So he deal with man from his sovereignty. He has the right and the power to rule all things according to his will, and he don't owe anybody an explanation. I like it when God finally speaks. He's not going to debate with Job. He's not going to debate with Job. He just said, let me reveal a little bit more about myself to you, because evidently you are very ignorant. <laughs> he didn't even debate with him. And after God finished revealing more of himself to uh, Job, Job just put his hand over his mouth. <laughs> He just put his head over his bow and said, I, I just cannot speak. I am so ignorant. <laughs> just a simple outline. Job is 42 chapter five section. Now let's look at, go down to verse six. In verse one through five, we see Job had everything. And in verse five, we see Job acting as a priest. He represented um, his family before God through praying for them. But then look at chapter six, I mean, verse six, and we're going to just briefly glance over chapter two, uh, verse 10. Now in verse six to chapter two, 10, we see Satan bringing affliction on Job back to back, back as God in his sovereignty is going to allow Job to go through all this affliction. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but in verse three, uh, verse 13 through 17, well, actually, look at verse 6. Now, there was a day, let me have somebody read, if you will, verse 6 through 12, 6 through 12. 6 through 12. Go ahead, go ahead. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thee? Then Satan answered, the Lord said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God, and excuse evil? Then Satan answered the Lord, said, That Job fears God or not? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only unto himself. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from Presence of the Lord, and there was a day when his okay, we'll stop right there. Thank you, thank you. So here we see Satan goes into the presence of God, and he uh, he got his eyes on this mature believer, Job, and God began to brag about the integrity of this man, Job. God knew that Job loved him more than he loved any detail in life, any of the blessing. 
Job loved God more than he loved the blessing. And God knew that. And so from that knowledge, God allowed, because he never gave us more than we can handle, he allowed Job to be uh, tested. Now, here's the deal. If Job's happiness was dependent on the details of life, his wealth, his family, um, um, his health being good, uh, if his happen was dependent on those things, he would fail the test that he's about to take. Now, God did not have a reason to inflict suffering on Job, okay? But God allowed Satan to have permission knowing that Job loved him more than he loved any details in, in life. Now, um, now, notice in verse uh, 10 that God had a hedge about Job and his house and all that he has on every side. This was his grace. And so nothing can come within that hedge unless God allowed it. That's his sovereignty. So God allowed it. And Satan uh, accused Job of only worshiping and serving God because of the blessing. Now, God know better than that, but that's, Jake, that's Satan accusing him that the only reason you got to manipulate, I mean, you got to manipulate people by blessing them in order for you to them to serve you. No one just serve you because they just want to serve you because of who you are. You got to actually bribe people. You got to bribe people to serve you. You, you got to look at all the blessing you have blessed them with. You're bribing Job. If you strip here all that, you strip, you strip all that stuff away from, take all those, you know, human crutches away from him and we'll see what he really made of. Well, God already knew what Job was made of. He knew Job happened did not depend on those things. So he's okay. I'm going to allow you to do whatever you want to do to him, but you can't take his life. And then if you go to, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to chapter. So in chapter uh, one and two, we see him losing everything. But then in chapter 11 through 13, uh, Job friend is going to respond to what he was going through. Can I get someone to read 11 through 13 right quick, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 11 through 13 of chapter 2. <laughs> now when Job's three friends heard of all these, all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Canaanite, Bilbao the Shuite, and Zephar the Nathanite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Amen. Now, Joe had earlier passed many tests, you know, the tests of losing his wealth and family. Um, the tests of losing his health, and he still worshiped and praised God. And um, his wife um, actually, you know, suggested that he curse God and die. Um, and he, she knew that if he did curse God, he will die. And so she gave him that advice. And he said, you sound like one of the foolish uh, women. He knew not to call his wife foolish. That's why he said, you sound like one of the foolish women. Because he knew probably knew what was going to happen if he called his wife foolish. But anyway, in chapter 3 through 37, we see Job limitation and three recurring cycles of rebuke and response between Job and his friend who came to comfort him. So the whole uh, chapter 3 through 37 is Job and his friend going back and forth, back and forth. Um, uh, they're going to rebuke Job. Job's going to respond. Now, just a, just a quick, uh, I'm going to take about five more minutes and we'll be through with this book. Now, in chapter four and five, we see his first friend, Eliphaz. And Eliphaz, as he speaks, and his speech is, is simply this. Unrighteous deserve judgment from God. And then in chapter six and seven, Job responds. I am innocent, though. 
I am suffering for no reason at all. And then in chapter eight, his other friend, Bildad speaks, God is just, therefore, Job, you must have sinned. Chapter nine and 10, Job responds, God has not dealt justly with me. I have not sinned. And then in chapter 11, his other friend speaks, so, uh, so far, no, Job, you are guilty. Chapter 11 and 12, Joe responds, you guys are worthless physicians. <laughs> <laughs> In chapter 15, Eliphaz speaks, Joe, you are detestable and you are corrupt. <laughs> now they came to sympathize and comfort him. Chapter 16 and 17, Joe responds, you guys are sorry, sorry comforters. What kind of friends are you? 18, chapter 18, Bildad, second speak. The wicked suffer, Job. Chapter 19, Job respond, God has wronged me. Chapter 19, Zophar, second speak. The wicked get their portion, Job. Job, you're wicked. Third, uh, chapter 21, Job respond, God's dealing with the wicked sometime in grace. Go to chapter 21, uh, verse 7 and 8. Now, Joe did have that right. Sometimes God deals with the, the wicked and great. Read verse 7 and 8, somebody, please. Why did the wicked live? Read the old age, you were mighty in power. Your offspring are established in their presence. So, Joe, uh, his friend, um, uh, Zophar, said, Joe, you're wicked. And, 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 and Joe said, you know what, you know what, sometimes God deal with even wicked people in grace. Eliphaz chapter 22, he said, yield now to God, Joe, yield to God. And Joe respond in chapter 23 and 24, God's dealing with the wicked. God remains silent and God seemed to ignore wrongdoing. That's him. Can you see him like having that self-pity? Because God, he, he wanted God to give an explanation, but God wasn't giving us. He was silent. He was quiet. And so uh, Job was a little, little frustrated there. And then um, in chapter 25, Bildad give another speech. Man cannot be just, Job. And then in verse 26 to 31, uh, uh, Job responds, I have been righteous. In chapter 32 through 37, Elihu speaks. God is righteous. You are depraved like everyone else, Joe. Now, this is someone else. This is not one of his three friends. Elihu came along. He said, Joe, don't be self-righteous. You know, you're, you're depraved just like everybody else because Joe had just said, oh, I, I have been right, though he is perfect. And then in chapter 38 and 39, we see uh, finally, God speaks. And let's just look at a couple of verses before we take a break when God speaks. And and um, so glad I wasn't there when he spoke. But look at verse, look at uh, Job 39. I'm just going to look at a couple of verses when God finally speaks. In 38, look at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, nor gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set his measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were it bases sung? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the songs of God shout for joy? Or who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud, its garment thick darkness, its swan and band, and I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt of doors. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther, and you here shall you your prior ways stop. So here, I want you to notice something in verse one through three. God um, gave no explanation when he began to speak, notice that. He didn't even just come, just start explaining to Job the problem of evil in the world. He didn't just begin to defend himself against Job calling him unjust. He made no uh, comment on 
you know, good people, good thing happened to good people and bad thing happened. He made no comment. What was the first thing did he do? He revealed himself to Joe and his friend to a, a degree that they had not previously known. And that revelation, you know what happened when God began to reveal himself? Look at verse, uh, look at verse um, 40. I mean, chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I laid my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer. Even twice, and I will add nothing more. He said, I'm not going to say nothing. He said, I'm not going to say anything. So what we see here, God reproved, uh, proved that Job and his friend was what? Y'all are ignorant. Y'all are ir ir ignorant. They could not understand or determine God's ways with nature. Therefore, they cannot understand or control God's dealing with people. God alone is the wise God. Now, in chapter 41 through 5, we see Job said, I am insignificant. Now, in chapter 46 to 41, 34, God rebuked Job again. Look at chapter 40, verse 6. Go to chapter 40, verse 6 um, through uh, 14, and look at when God rebuked him again. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, now gird up your loins like a man. I will, I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you uh, really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity. Enclose yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowing of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Joe, can you do that? <laughs> God said, Joe, can you do that? Well, I can. I can do that. I can bring a proud person and make him low in just a second. Look at everyone who is proud and humble and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in hidden places. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. So in other words, Joe, not only are you ignorant, but you don't understand my ways and how I deal with people. And what did Job do? Go to chapter 42, verse 1 and 6. Verse 1 through 6 of 40, chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be taunted. Who is this that high counts without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here now, I will speak, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. God humbled him. And in chapter 42, verse 7 through 9, God rebuked Job's friends for their wrong assessment of Job, because Job was not suffering because of anything that he had done. And then in closing, in chapter 42, 10 through 17, God restores the fortune of Job. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for you revealing yourself to this believer's experience with suffering. And it is my prayer that some questions will be answered uh, by those who may be here with questions. But Lord, we are so ignorant and you're the wise God. And we don't always understand, but you want us to trust you and obey you even when we don't understand because you're still the sovereign creator. Even though you don't do all things, nothing can happen unless you allow it. We cannot understand your ways, but you want us to trust and obey you. Keep our minds and heart in Christ's name, amen. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back for our second section in our study of First Corinthians. Thank you.